Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now you're probably watching this on a desktop or a laptop or a, or a smartphone and it's probably a device with multiple cores, you know, it kind of it could be a quad core or an octa core and you are running multiple programs at the same time. Now when you do that, you can get a problem called resource contention, which means two programs want to access the same resource at the same time. Now there's a way to illustrate this problem that's been used famously for many, many years called the dining philosophers problem. So I want to look today at resource contention, deadlock, and the dining philosophers problem. So if you want to know more about it, please let me explain. So in a computer system, things like the memory, things like the file system, the networking, the, the video card, the display, can only be accessed generally by one program at a time. You definitely don't want a program when you're writing, let's say, a spreadsheet, and another program can overwrite the same spreadsheet at the same time that you're writing to it, because you're going to get a corrupted data. This doesn't only apply to high-level things like an Excel spreadsheet or a database, it also applies to low-level things like uh, the file system or memory. You certainly don't want two programs trying to access the same memory location at the same time because you're going to end up with gibberish. Now, there's a very famous software engineer who's laid down many, many fundamentals of software engineering called Dijkstra, and he wanted to illustrate this problem to other people, and he came up with this idea of the dining philosophers. So let's have a look at it. So the idea behind the dining philosophers problem is there are five philosophers who are sitting on a round table and each one has a bowl of food in front of them. But there is only one fork between each bowl, which means there are five forks and five bowls of food. And to eat, a, a philosopher needs to have a fork from the left and a fork from the right and then use both of them to feed himself. Now when he's not feeding, he can actually be thinking. And the problem runs like this, because they're all independent, they're all running in parallel, once the program starts, each philosopher might, let's say, grab the fork on his left, and then they will try to grab the fork on the right. But the moment they've grabbed the fork on the left, all the other philosophers have also grabbed the fork on the left, which means now when they try to grab the fork on the right, they can't, because the person, the philosopher on the right, has grabbed it as their fork on the left. And now what happens is all the philosophers are in their thinking mode and they're not eating and they're waiting for the fork on the right to become free and it will never happen because we're in a circle and you have deadlock and you have resource starvation and in fact in this picture the philosophers will starve because they will only ever think and they will never eat. So if you think about a modern day operating system, whether it's Windows or Mac OS or Linux, these kind of situations arise about not forks, but about the network or the memory or the file system. And what you don't want is two processes, two programs that kind of mutually exclusively lock each other out. So program A says, I want something that program B wants. And program B says, I want something that program A wants. And they both just sit there waiting for each other and there's no way to escape. Now there are many ways of solving this dining philosopher's problem. I want to show you what's probably the easiest way to understand. Let's imagine that we introduce a waiter into the room and he lays down a rule. He says that only one philosopher at a time can pick up uh, one or maximum two forks. And what this means is that they have to ask the waiter permission, can I please pick up the forks please? And he might say yes, and then only at that moment can one philosopher actually be in the process of picking up uh, some forks. So it would work like this, if philosopher number one wanted to pick up some forks, it would ask permission, he would ask permission, and then the answer would be, yes, you can do that. So the philosopher would pick up the fork on the left, and then the second fork, the fork on the right, and then say to the waiter, I've picked up my uh, forks. And then let's say the philosopher on the left now wants to try, and so she says, okay, can I pick up my forks? And the waiter says, yes, please try. And she picks up the fork on her left, but when she tries to pick up the fork on her right, she finds that actually it's already occupied. So she renounces the fork on the left, puts it down, and says to the waiter, I'll try again later. Now the third philosopher then says, well, can I pick up some forks? And the waiter says, yes, you can. And so he picks up the fork on the left and he picks up his fork on the right and he starts eating. And then now the fourth and the fifth philosopher both try to pick up forks, but they don't have a pair and so they wait. And now philosophers two and uh, four and five are waiting while philosopher one and three are eating. After 10 minutes or so, they will put down their forks and now the philosophers can ask again, can we now pick up our forks? And so what the waiter does here is introduce the idea of a monitor. 
a mechanism that can actually monitor what's going on and control the order in which things are happening. And this is done using a thing called a lock. Now with a lock, what happens is that by requesting access to something, you gain the lock and other people cannot gain access to it while you hold the lock. And then what happens is once you've picked up the two forks, you can then free the lock saying, well, now anybody else can try it if they want to. So it's called a locking mechanism. A modern day operating systems have many, many locks and they go in and out of these locked areas all the time to make sure there is not a clash of uh, resources, a clash of trying to do the same thing at the same time. Now, there's a couple of other quick things to mention here, and that is that once philosophers one and three have actually finished eating, they will put down their forks, and then maybe philosopher two and four will ask for uh, the right to pick up forks, and they will succeed because those forks are now free, but for philosopher five doesn't get a go until the third round. Now you can get the situation where once you get to the third round, philosopher one asks again, can he pick up the forks? And of course, poor old philosopher five never gets a chance. So you also need to have in some scheduling here that gives a priority about who is allowed to ask for these forks. And in this case, you might use something like minutes since the last time they ate, which would bump up philosopher number five to the top of the queue so that he could always ask first for the forks and then one and two and three and four have to wait because they've actually already eaten. And there's one other thing worth mentioning that is the locking needs to be atomic. You can't have the situation where two of the philosophers ask for the lock, ask for the right to pick up forks and the waiter says to both of them, yes, you can. So there has to be a mechanism where when one program is asking for a lock, another program can't gain the lock in that moment. That's called an atomic operation. Now the uh, operating system, whether it's Windows or Mac or OS X, will actually provide an atomic locking mechanism to guarantee that when one program is asking for a lock, another program can't swoop in and get the lock before it or at the same time, whatever. And those are provided by the operating system. And so there you have it, the idea of Dining Philosophers, a way to avoid deadlock in which two or more programs are asking for the same resource, but they're waiting on each other to free up an existing resource. You've also got the idea of a monitor, and the monitor employs the idea of a lock, an atomic lock, to make sure that there is kind of a, an agreed order of things on who can pick up, who can pick up the forks, who can access the resources at any one time. And software engineers who are dealing with multi-threaded, multi-process systems have to use this kind of locking all the time. And it is a, a good skill to learn, and this is the basic fundamentals of how you understand uh, locking in a multi-threaded or a multi-process system. Well, my name is Gary Sims, and this is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Please, you know what I'm gonna ask you, please subscribe. Please hit that bell notification icon so you become part of the notification squad. Please share this on social media, and I would love to read your comments uh, below this video. And well, that's about it. I'll see you in the next one.